Have you ever had a friend that's like really flaky? Anybody? Come on, you can be honest. We're in church. Anybody got that friend that's like flake 5,000? Just like, yeah, okay, okay, okay. But you know that friend that, that always says that they're going to do something, but they never come through? You been there? Like, yo, bro, let's go get tacos. It's Taco Tuesday. I'm going to drive. I'm going to come pick you up in five minutes. You know, I'm buying. You can even have the ox cord. Whoa, 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 the ox cord. This is too good to be true. Right, so you're waiting. Your friend, he's talking all that good stuff, and you're so stoked, and the five minutes turns into five hours. You're still waiting. You're still hungry. You wanted those tacos, man, right? And so you hit that person up. You're like, yo, well, why didn't you come through? And this is their answer, classic. Sorry, bro. Something came up. Oh, really? Something came, I feel something stirring up within me, y'all. It, and it ain't Taco Bell. It's, it's some anger, okay? <laughs> but it's, it's so funny because I've had way too many flaky friends. It's not really funny, but you kind of laugh about it looking back. Anybody have way too many flaky friends in their life? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you are, you are like, I am that flaky friend. Well, <laughs> hallelujah. Thank you so much for uh, letting us in on that. But uh, I've had one too many flaky friends. I even had this friend who planned this entire event. He hyped it up. He, like, bought a mariachi band, right? Like, it was crazy. He, like, hyped it up, invited everyone and the night of, homeboy didn't even show up to his own event. I'm like, how can you, like, flake on yourself? That's like a new level of flake. I'm like, bro, I'm going to have to buy you some head and shoulders because you're too flaky, man. Like, keep, keep that dandruff away from me, man. I enjoy my, my Jimmy Dean breakfast croissant flakes more than I enjoy you, okay? Like, I don't got time for those flaky friends. But this is the truth. The truth about flaky friends is that they just have a hard time with commitment. You know, they say what they wish, but they live how they want. They say one thing, but they live another, and their actions don't match their words. They say, yo, I'm always going to be there for you through thick and thin. I'll, I'll always have your back. Yo, yo, girl, we're besties for the resties, right? Like, well, we're good. We're good to go. Nothing can steal our friendship, and then something comes up. Some other person that maybe looks a little better or some situation that looks just a little bit better comes along. Things get hard. Something happens and they bounce. Their words don't match up with their actions. Maybe you've had a freaky, uh, a freaky, a flaky friend or two in your life. Or maybe you are that flaky friend. Maybe you're that flaky friend. Some of you are nodding your head like, yes, pastor, I confess. Have mercy on my soul. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but for real, don't be flaky. Okay, all right. Moving on. But, y'all, our words need to match up with our actions. Our walk has to match our talk. Because if we're not walking it like we're talking it, then we're just a flaky friend. And tonight I want to talk all about flaky friends. We're going to dig in a story in the Bible in just a minute and see what God's word has to say about all this. But the title of tonight's message is Flaky Friends. You can write that down if you're taking notes. If you're not, you better be because you're going to forget and this is, this is important for you. We're going to be in Luke chapter 22, verses 54 through 62. I'm reading from the Passion Translation. It's one of my favorites. Um, and uh, so you can, you can turn there if you want, Google it. Um, but I'll have it up for you on the screens in just a moment. But before we read, I want to give you guys a little bit of context as to what's been going down during this time that, that Luke 22 is written. Um, so Jesus has just spent the, the previous evening in the upper room, in this upper room in Jerusalem with his 12 disciples. Um, and it, it really, my friends, is an incredible scene. We, we see so much of God's heart. We see his character. We see um, just, just this beautiful picture painted. You know, it's, it's heavy. It's beautiful. It's crazy. It's, it's this experience that Jesus has with his boys. And I want to encourage you to, to check it out, to read the full story as you spend time with Jesus this week. But the events that occurred in the upper room are important. I just want to highlight them, and then we're going to go into what we got tonight. 
Um, but the, the events of the upper room are described. If you want to write these down, you can check it out later. In Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 13. There's a few verses, but you can just read the whole chapter and see for yourself. But during these last hours that Jesus is spending with his friends, he ate with them. He instituted the new covenant in his blood, you know, communion. They, they partook in that together. He gave them last-minute instructions and encouragement. He prophesied of what was to come, the betrayal, him going to the cross, him, him rising again, all of this stuff. And he prayed over his friends. During this time in the upper room, one of Jesus' followers named Judas, we all know Judas, he left to go and betray Jesus. One of his own friends, one of his own disciples was a flaky friend and stabbed him in the back and betrayed him. Jesus and the disciples, then they go on, they leave the upper room, they go to the garden and they start praying. And Jesus knew all along what was to come. He had it under control. Betrayal, torture, abandonment, death. That's the picture. That's where we're at. And so this brings us to our story right now where it continues and where we receive what God has for us. Let's read this together. Luke 22. We'll have it up for you on the screens. Passion Translation, verse 54 says, The religious leaders seized Jesus and led him away. But Peter followed from a safe distance. They brought him to the home of the high priest where people were, all, were already gathered out in the courtyard. Someone had built a fire, so Peter inched closer and sat down among them to stay warm. A girl noticed Peter sitting in the firelight. Staring at him, she pointed out to him and said, This man is one of Jesus' disciples. Peter flatly denied it, saying, What are you talking about, girl? I don't know him. A little while later, someone else spotted Peter and said, Hey, I recognize you. You're one of his. I know it. Peter again said, I'm not one of his disciples. Would you stop it already? Verse 59, about an hour later, someone else identified Peter and insisted he was a disciple of Jesus, saying, look at him. He's from Galilee just like Jesus. I know he's one of them. But Peter was adamant. He said, listen, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't you understand it? I don't even know him. All the words were still in his mouth, the rooster crowed. And at that moment, the Lord, who was being led through the, the courtyard by his captors, turned around and gazed at Peter. All at once, Peter remembered the words Jesus had prophesied over him. Before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny three times that you don't even know me. Peter burst into tears, ran off from the crowd, and wept bitterly. There's three things you guys can write down tonight. Three things we're going to look at. The first is this. Write this down. Number one, a dangerous distance. A dangerous distance. A few years back, my, uh, my cousin Jacob and I, we were in, in Australia, Yeg and I might land down under, fish our friends, not food. Um, and we're, we're in Australia, we're hanging out with our family, and uh, we, we went down south to this place. It's one of my favorite places on the planet. It's called Hamlin Bay. We call it Hammy Bay because we Aussies like to shorten things because that's just how we roll. Um, so Hammy Bay, man, beautiful spot. We're hanging out down uh, on the beach, and we're pretty adventurous, maybe kind of dangerous, kind of reckless. Um, and it's, I've had to cool off because I'm married now. I'm a dad, you know. Um, but we were hanging out, and we had these kayaks. And at Hamlin Bay, if you're standing right here on the beach and you look out, you'll see this island about a mile and a half away. And we're like, yeah, mate, let's go uh, swim to the island, you know, and explore, mate, and all this stuff. We're like, yeah, 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 all right, let's do it. So we get in our kayaks, and we start paddling out. It takes maybe 30, 40 minutes. Um, but funny, funny thing, my, my cousin Jacob, he had this, like, floating bathtub, okay? Just this big old kayak. It's, like, two feet thick, man. He's, he's, he's fine. He's great. But I have this, like, three-inch thick, like, sea kayak, and it's wobbling around, and I'm trying to get in and, and, like, paddle, and there's legit stingrays all over. I'm like, I might die, but I'm in Australia, so whatever. And so I finally get on this kayak. I start paddling out. We make it. It's awesome. 
I didn't realize this at the time, but we spent six hours exploring. I looked like a, like a crab, you know, just super burned. But, you know, Chantel still thought I looked good. So I thought I looked hot. You know, burn, baby, burn. What's up? Um, and, uh, and so we're on the island. We're like, oh, dude, like there's a big old storm coming. We better go, right? It's like, yeah, okay. Um, if you know anything about <laughs> storms and the ocean, they don't play very nice, okay? So we look, and we're like, this storm's coming in. We get in the kayaks. We got to go, man. So we're going. The waves are coming in. I'm in this little kayak, bro, and the, the beautiful crystal clear blue ocean water turned black. Waves are getting bigger. The wind's picking up. I'm thinking, I could, like, die. Like, this is kind of crazy. And my cousin Jacob, he's just a little bit ahead. And at that moment, I realized, you know what? I, I got to get close to him because if something happens, I can drag him down with me. We're going down together, all right? That, those are the facts. I'm like, bro, hey, hey Jake, you know, so I paddle and paddle, and we get so close that, that it, it was beneficial because I was like, dude, if I go down, you can help me. If you go down, you can help me. But this was a dangerous situation, and we were in this together, and I'm glad he wasn't a flaky friend and just said, stuff you, bro, and just, you know, he's like, a, he's, a, he's like Avatar, bro. He's 6'5", just shreddy, just powered, powered away. I'm like, okay, thanks, bro. Like, I'm just going to die. But I'm glad my cousin's not a flaky friend because in the storm, we were in that together. And here, here's the truth. In life, there are dangerous situations. There are storms in your life that you will face, things in life that won't be as desirable as you want them to be. But wouldn't it be nice to have someone in that storm who isn't going to flake on you, who isn't going to just steal your kayak or who's going to push you down so they can stay afloat? Wouldn't it be nice to have someone in the storm with you? There are dangerous times in life, my friends. There's times where we face struggles and trials and things that just kind of come out of nowhere. Anybody been there? Life's great. You're chugging along, and then this thing comes out of nowhere. You're like, whoa, what on earth? Anybody been there? Yeah, I've been there too. Sometimes we see these storms, right? Like me and my cousin, we saw this storm. Sometimes we don't see the storm, my friends. Sometimes something comes out of left field. Something happens with your mom. Something happens with your friends. Something happens with you, to you, against you. But can I just pause real quick? Can I just say that although you may not see your storm coming, Jesus sees it already? That even though you may not see what's going to come your way, Jesus already has seen it, friend. He's already conquered it. So if you're going through something right now, man, Jesus is all over it. So rejoice, praise him in advance for the fact that he's going to get you through it and he's going to make you better because of it. So there's a dangerous situation happening right now in this story. Jesus has just been betrayed. He's being led away. He's in chains. This is a dangerous thing that's happening. He's being led away to be killed. The storm seemed to come out of nowhere for Peter and the disciples. But Jesus knew about it all along. In fact, this was part of of his plan. I want you to notice real quick, we could put up verse 54 again. It says that the religious leader seized Jesus and led him away, but Peter followed him. I need your help. Peter followed him from a what? Safe distance. Peter followed Jesus from a safe distance. Why is it that when things are so good in life that it's so easy to follow Jesus? But as soon as something gets hard, as soon as something gets tough, we just say, you know what, Jesus, I'm out. I'm going to just bail on you. Why is it that when it's so easy, when, when things in life are so good that it's so easy to follow Jesus, but the minute something goes south, we want to run away? The truth is this, my friend. Jesus is security. Jesus is safety. If he's in the middle of a dangerous situation, then why are you trying to run from the storm? If he's in the middle of that, that dangerous thing, if he's in the middle of that storm, then the safest place for you to be is right there with Jesus. That's the safest place for you to be. As I was with Jacob, man, in that storm, I knew we had each other. 
But we think that the, the further we get away from Jesus, the, 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 the more comfortable it is to follow from a safe distance, we, we think that we'll be better off. But the truth is, is that the closer we get to the storm, the safer we are because Jesus is in the middle of the storm. So are we following Jesus tonight? Are we following him from a safe distance? Or are we following him from a dangerous distance? You see, Jesus was led away. He was betrayed. He was taken in chains. He was going to be led to the cross. But Peter bounced on him. Things got tough. They were in the garden praying, and Peter said, I'm out. So Jesus goes alone when all of his flaky friends flaked out and disappeared. I just want to say tonight that Jesus is looking for dangerous Christians. That he's looking for, for courageous Christians. He's, he's looking for, for dangerous Christians, not safe Christians. Christians that are willing to get out of the boat, that are willing to go to the middle of the storm, that are willing to charge the gates of hell, to go to new territory, to, to put a stake in the ground and say, this land belongs to God. He's looking for dangerous Christians. So come in close, my friend. Tonight, don't, don't just follow Jesus from a safe distance. Don't just look at him as he's walking and, and say, oh, man, like, are you okay, Jesus? Like, I should be there, but I'm not. And, and don't follow him from a safe distance. Come in close. Because true safety is found when we live closely to Jesus. Go where he is. Go into the storm. Because I promise you that he will be waiting for you. That God will be waiting for you. Peter wasn't willing to go into the middle of the storm with Jesus, but are you? Are you willing to go? Are you willing to get out of the boat to, to not deny Jesus, but to stand for Jesus and to go where he calls and go where he leads you? Peter was a flaky friend, and his actions didn't match his words. Throughout the Gospels, Peter's always the one that had a big mouth. Anybody have a big mouth? Anybody's friends? You know, I won't admit that. Anybody's friends got a big mouth, right? They just talk and talk and talk, but they don't walk and walk and walk. Peter was always saying, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I'll never deny you. Jesus, I'll go to the grave with you. But here Jesus is walking alone because Peter bounced when things got tough. When things got tough, he ran. And when he ran, he denied knowing and following Jesus. So ask yourself this question tonight. Am I only following Jesus from a safe distance? The second thing you can write down is this. Number two, his kingdom, not my comfort. His kingdom, not my comfort. I got I to gotta tell you guys something that's super cool. Um, when I was in middle school, believe it or not, I was actually a, a professional third wheeler. Um, you know, not, 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 not four wheels, no third wheels, y'all. I, I was a professional third wheeler, you know, not having a date but going on dates with my friends. Prof any, any professional third wheelers in here? Yeah, Okay. <laughs> You're like, hashtag forever alone, hashtag, oh my gosh, hashtag Jesus take the wheel, lead me to my man, my girl, hashtag, I got, I got news flash. Singleness is in the Bible, Rebecca, read your word, okay? Like, know, know the word of God, oh my gosh. <laughs> hashtag pray for me, please, Cody, help, help, just tell God to bring me my man, just, mmm, mmm. Yo, bro, just tell Jesus to bring me my girl. Ooh, right? Stop playing Fortnite. She'll come. That's it. <laughs> but in middle school, all my friends were dating. And I was still trying to figure out, like, do girls got cooties? Like, if I talk to her, will my head explode? Like, if she punches me in the face and calls me really hurtful and mean things but winks at me, like, does she love me? Like... What is this? 
Well, my friends are dating. I'm trying to figure out the mind of a woman. Newsflash, I'm still trying to figure out the mind of a woman. <laughs> but I was just third wheeling for days. Some of y'all are like, Cody, I've been third wheeling for years. Oh, I can't see the light. Help, help me, Jesus. <laughs> but I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've been through. Third wheeling is really, really uncomfortable. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. You're like, I don't want to see you eat your spaghetti like Lady in the Tramp, okay? I don't want to see you like comb his hair like 65 times with your mom's brush. Like, oh my gosh. I don't want to see you like play Fortnite anymore. Like, oh my gosh. Like, Third wheeling is really, 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 really uncomfortable. We've established that. <laughs> but we see here in verses 55 through 61, we see a really uncomfortable situation. Because the truth is, no one likes uncomfortable situations. No one likes to be uncomfortable. No one likes to, to have to do something that you don't feel comfortable with. You feel weird. You feel like, should I talk to them? Should I not? Will they hate me? Will they love me? I don't know. Like, no one likes an uncomfortable situation. But here in verses 55 through 61, we see Peter deny Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. He denied the same Jesus who, who walked with him, who called him, who, who, who loved him, who, who saved his soul. The same Jesus that he lived life with, that he loved, that, that he knew, he's denying his friend three times. How easy is it, my friend, to be more concerned about our comfort rather than his kingdom? It's easy. It's easy to be more concerned with how comfortable we are in life than, 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 than his kingdom. It's easy to talk the Christian talk, but it's another thing to walk the Christian walk. It's funny because all of Jesus' disciples were flaky friends. All of them were. You know, we know about the 12, and, and I mean, correct me, my Bible says that Jesus went alone. <laughs> Not Jesus and John and James and, and, and Peter, but Jesus was led away. Not Jesus and the disciples, but Jesus was led away. All of his friends were flaky friends. Like, why is that Jesus? Like, why was Jesus taken alone? Shouldn't there be 11 others in chains? There should have been, but they all ran away. Mark 14 Verse 50 says, at the point of his arrest, all of his disciples ran away and abandoned him. Great Jesus, you picked some great friends. <laughs> you picked a bunch of flakes, man, that, that when things got tough, they all left. Not just Peter, but they all abandoned Jesus. I don't want to just single out Peter. I, want, I don't want to just say Peter was the worst and this and that. Friend, all of the God squad... <laughs> Abandoned God. All of the God squad, all of Jesus' crew, they, they all abandoned him. They all were flaky friends. How often do we run from God because the waters he is calling us to go into aren't comfortable? How often do we want to dip our big toe in the, in the water and test the temperature and say, you know what, God, like, that's cool, but I kind of want to, like, see what I'm getting into. Like, can you send me, like, an itinerary of, like, when the pain's coming and, like, when the blessing is? I just want the blessing, God. Like, we just want what's comfortable instead of pursuing after his kingdom. If your desire is to be a comfortable Christian, then may I say that you may not be a kingdom Christian. If your desire is just to be comfortable in this life, then may I say that you may not be a kingdom Christian. Because Jesus is not sitting back with his feet up in this story, is he? Where is he? He's in chains. And he went willingly. It's not like he just, oh, surprise, oh, my gosh, like, where did you come? He knew all along. And he picked those flaky friends despite knowing that they would one day abandon him. We need to be about his kingdom, not our comfort. 
the truth is being a comfy Christian is, is, is fun. Being a, a flaky Christian is comfortable. Following from a safe distance, kind of seeing the situation before it happens. You know, we, we want to we wanna keep a, a safe distance because we're afraid to get in close for whatever reason. You know, wanting to test out this whole Jesus thing, wanting to, to test drive this whole thing. And it's really easy to, to be a comfy Christian, isn't it? It's so easy to be a flaky friend like Peter, like John, like the rest of the crew. But it is something that you must realize that Jesus doesn't want. Jesus doesn't want flaky friends. He says in Revelation 3.16, But because you are neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. He loves you still. You're flaking on him. He loves you so much. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But you need to know that, that our calling is not to be comfortable. Our calling is not to be on the fence. Our calling is not to be, have one foot in the church and one foot in the club. We're, we can't live like that. We can't serve two masters. Jesus says, because you're lukewarm, because you're right in the middle, because you're not hot, you're not cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. He says, how I wish that you were hot. How I wish that you were cold. Either be for me or be against me. Don't be in the middle. Because when we're lukewarm, we're painting a brush that Jesus never meant for us to paint about him. He said, it's okay to live like this. It's okay to live like that. Man, God cares only about this stuff, but he cares about it. People are going for a living like, who is Jesus? Is, who, is he who the Bible says, who pastors talk about, or is he the God that, that you're living like? We can't paint a brush that, that points people away from Jesus. Either you're for him or you're against him. Either you're hot or you're cold. Either you're a comfy, flaky, you know, Thursday night, Sunday morning Christian, or you're a 24-7 faithful follower of the Most High God. Guys, we can't be flaky. We can't just talk it and not walk it. Got to be faithful. Tonight, I want to just encourage us and just invite you. Can we make a stand tonight to, to, to put our comfort aside for a moment, to get out on the waves, to get out of this boat and to say, you know what, God, I want to just stand for you. I don't, I don't want to be flaky. I don't want to. To, to show people a false representation of you. I don't want to, to show people that, that you're okay with, with some sin but not other sin. Like, like I, I, I just want to live for you. Friend, this is the generation that God wants to do something powerful through. You are the future of the church. You are the future of this world. Can you stand and say, I'm not going to bow to anything besides my creator. I'm not going to give in to any fear. I'm going to stand. I'm going to go because he has called me and he has equipped me and he has chosen me to change this world. I see a generation rising. Don't be flaky. Say, God, wherever you lead me, I'm going to go because I know that it's a place that you've already gone before. Jesus will never lead you to a place that he is not at. You need to know, I want to I comfort some of you tonight. Jesus knows what it's like to be left out. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to be stabbed in the back and made fun of and not included. He knows what it's like to be loved and praised and, and, and welcomed but then rejected and despised. He knows what you're going through. You're like, no, he doesn't. Yeah, he does. <laughs> and if he's in the storm and he's leading you there, then you go. Because he is with you. He has gone before you. He's prepared the way for you. So you don't follow from a safe distance. Not where it's comfy. Not where you're just kind of testing this thing out. Friend, you dive in. Trusting that, that you're diving into something that maybe you can't see. Maybe you can't explain. But he is there. He will catch you. He will guide you. He will be with you. He promises it. 
says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you until the end of the age. Go into the uncomfortable situation. What does that look like for you? You know, we're not, we're not fighting for our lives. Praise God. We live in a country that, I mean, so far has been open to us worshiping God and going out in public. Like, anybody thankful for that? I know we take it for granted, but that we can be safe, that we can worship here and worship God and not have to meet underground and run for our lives. Well, let's, let's bring it here. Who's that person you got to go talk to that you, you just don't like? What, what's that conversation you need to have with that boyfriend or girlfriend that keeps trying to get you to do things? Or hang out with certain people that you don't agree with? Who, who do you need to talk to who keeps wanting you to compromise your faith? What uncomfortable situation do you need to step into? Because it's not about how you feel. It's about his kingdom. It's not about me. It's not about God, man. Like, I just, you know, like, I just don't want to deal with drama and, and sin. And I'm just going to, like, teach the Bible and that's it. <laughs> There's pastors that do that. But friend, a pastor is called to be a shepherd, to shepherd his people that God has placed. And I'm going into the uncomfortable, trust me. I don't need to go into it. But will you go as well? Will you say, you know what, God, I just, I'm just i going to go to the deep waters. I'm going to get out of my, my, my yacht, and I'm going to go on this raft, and I'm going to swim, and I'm going to kayak out in the middle of the ocean where there's sharks and black water and, and waves. I'm just going to go because I know you'll be there with me, and I know that your kingdom is greater than my comfort. You want to do something. You want to set people free. You want to heal addictions. You want to break bondage. You want to, to give eternal life and mercy and peace and forgiveness. And who am I to get in the way of that? It's about his kingdom, not my comfort. It was easy for Peter to follow along from a distance, wasn't it? Where he didn't have to, to confront or he didn't have to, to, to step out and, and be uncomfortable. The fact that he denied Jesus shows us that in that moment, he didn't want to accept the fact that he belonged to Jesus. And that he was willing, he wanted to be comfortable instead of being uncomfortable and saying, you know what, I do belong to Jesus. I need to be in those chains as well. So what do you need to do this week? What uncomfortable situation do you need to, to handle so that his kingdom can be expanded and your comfort can go out the window? <laughs> the last thing we can write down, I want to invite the band up. We'll close with this. Faithful followers. Not flaky followers, but faithful followers. Maybe you're here tonight. And as you hear these words... You're realizing that you are that flaky friend. Let's take it to a different place. You're not just a flaky friend to your friends on earth, but you've been a flaky follower to God in heaven. Maybe you're realizing this now. Maybe God is speaking to you. Maybe you've realized that you've been talking the talk but not walking the walk. Maybe you've realized that you've been following from a safe distance and that you need to come in and follow from a dangerous distance to get close to God. Maybe you've realized that you've been living for your comfort rather than his kingdom. Maybe that's you. And if it is, I got good news for you. You can put up verse 55 again. Let's look at this. Someone had built a fire, so Peter inched closer and sat down among them to stay warm. Someone built a fire. Peter noticed it. He noticed this fire, so he, he inches closer and closer. 
And he begins to come closer and closer to the Jesus that he's denied over and over again. And he comes closer and closer and he sits down among these people around this fire. And he sits down among them to stay warm. When there's light, it's noticeable, isn't it? When there's a light, it's noticeable. When there's warmth, it's desired. Can't you see that Peter is desired to this light? He's attracted to go close to this light, to this fire, to, to sit warm. And, and could it be that Jesus had planned all along for that fire to be there? So that even in the coldness of Peter's denial, he could still feel the warmth of Jesus' acceptance. That even in the coldness of the denial, even though he had denied Jesus three times, he could still see and feel the fact that his father still loved him. That even though he's denied Jesus, even though he's denied the Messiah, Jesus still accepts him. As Peter feels the warmth of God's love, as he feels it, he, he still denies Jesus, and he denies, and he denies, and he denies a third time until the very moment he says, I do not know him, the rooster crows, and he is reminded as Jesus looks at him. He's reminded of all the things that Jesus said that he was going to do says that he broke. He went away and he wept bitterly. I want you to know that Jesus is looking at you right now. That he's looking at you tonight. And it's not a look that has anger in his eyes or disappointment in his heart. It's a, it's, it's a look that has tears of love and acceptance looking at you saying, I know you denied me, but I still accept you. I know you're a flake, but, but I'm not, and I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to hurt you or turn my back on you. God provided that fire. God provided this situation. Because until Peter denied Jesus, he couldn't truly accept Jesus. Until he came to a point where he realized, man, I, I need Jesus. It's, it's less to me. And the reality is that in denying Jesus, it led him to a place of repentance. If you know the story, you'll know that Jesus had two disciples blatantly deny him. We know about Peter, denied him three times. But we also know of another disciple named Judas who blatantly denied Jesus, betrayed him, sold him for the price of a common slave. And there's a parallel here, and you need to know this tonight. Is that Peter denied Jesus, but his tears were tears of repentance. Judas denied Jesus, but his, his tears were tears of regretfulness. See, it's easy, and that, this is the, the devil's trick is to condemn you. When you fall, he's, he points the finger, says you're not good enough, you must stop. God can never accept you again. He can never love you again. You're too far. You're too tainted. Well, conviction of the Holy Spirit says you're not good enough, but I am, and I've gone to the cross, and I've forgiven you, and I've healed you of sin and made a way, and you just turn to me tonight. You can't be restored unless there's repentance. Judas was stuck in this shame and this state of regretfulness that did not lead to repentance, and he went off and killed himself. Condemnation leads to death, but conviction leads to life. Did you know that Jesus even prophesied to Peter that he would deny Jesus? But Jesus says this. He says, Peter, after you have denied me and after you are restored to me, go and strengthen your brothers in the faith. You know what this tells me? That there is no mess that can outdo God's mercy. 
There is no failure that can outdo his forgiveness. There is nothing that you can do to out sin the love of God. That God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And just because you mess up doesn't mean he won't still use you later. Just because Peter messed up, God still had a plan and he became a pillar in the church. Did you know that? That on the rock, Jesus built his church. That Peter goes on to preach a message that 3,000 people are saved. There's growth. There's revival. And even though Peter fell and failed, God still used him anyways. And I want to tell you tonight that even though you've fallen, even though you've failed, God will still use you. God still loves you. He still has a purpose. Come on, anybody excited about that? That God wants to use you despite anything you can do. And God will turn a flaky friend into a faithful follower because of the cross of Christ. The invitation is there, friend. All you need to do is step up and say, yeah, God, I've fallen short. Yeah, God, I've messed up. But, God, I'm turning to be not just a flaky friend, but I want to be a faithful follower. God, would you help me to, to live for you? I repent of my sin. I can feel your Holy Spirit right now convicting me. And I feel, God, and I want to make a decision to stand and to follow you from flaky friend to faithful follower.